Welcome to the Business of Race podcast, where we examine issues of race and racism, their impact on businesses, and how organizations and corporations can address them those issues more effectively while creating a better work environment for all their employees. I'm your host, Regina Newkirk Rucci, the Director of Equity for 90 Forward. And today in the conference room, I am joined by the sensational and spectacular Deirdre Connor, who is a board member of 90 Forward, as well as a communications expert. And I have the magnetic and magnanimous Dr. Kimberly Allen, who is the CEO of 90 Forward. And 90 Forward is a racial equity and justice organi- nonprofit organization located here in Jacksonville, Florida. Welcome to the conference room, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Don't forget magnificent. Magnificent. <laughs> magnanimous. Magnificent. Magnifique. Mm-hmm. You flatter me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. It's all true. So, you know, really want to just get right down to business. And so I want to talk about this issue that has come up uh, with several organizations lately and people who have been interviewing candidates of color when they have already hired someone for the role. And so I was going to call it avoiding the diversity checkbox because that's what's happening. Hey, we have to interview a diverse candidate pool So even though I already know so-and-so's got the job, I still will need to make sure that I'm interviewing people. And so we want to talk about how organizations can avoid that. But before we get into that, let's let's talk about a couple of the organizations that have had this issue, right? So there's been a good amount of attention with the lawsuit with the NFL, right? Uh, And then this is sort of what I would say a legacy look, looking at you know, um, over a decade of coaching behavior and coaches, especially uh, black coaches who have been overlooked, who have not gotten promoted, who have not been able to sort of continue, uh, so even some coaches who had really successful uh, stints as head coaches, right? Uh, Tony Dungy and Levy Smith and get to the Super Bowl, still don't have the longevity set some less successful coaches, white coaches have had. And so they have not had the movement. And I think with the NFL, the NFL is fighting a culture, right? Um, You're not used to having people in these positions that hasn't been the tradition. Um, And even just of who you think of for the head coaching position, Um, you're not necessarily in tune of thinking of uh, a coach of color or this defensive uh, coach, et cetera. So how should organizations who have historically not had diverse hiring, diverse promotion, how do you do some of that culture busting to really create something different in an organization like that? Well, I think um, it requires intention um, and intention in your pool. So um, in the NFL's case, right, I think they have a pretty large pool. If you think about assistant coaches and folks who help out on the sidelines who may not even have a coaching title. Um, But as as a candidate pool, that pool is probably a lot more diverse than the actual head coaching position. And so then the question becomes, so where are you choosing Um, from what's the criteria to be chosen, um, and hence the Rooney Rule, right? And the whole reason why the thought was you have to uh, interview at least, I think, two African Americans for the position. Um, But here's the problem when we create rules with great intentions, right, Um, that ultimately in, in, in what I would consider tokenism, uh, and, and ultimately the wasting of time of those folks who really are interested in the role and really don't actually have a shot. And so um, I think, um, one, we have to ex- be careful, I think, with even setting the rules. What's the real intention? What is the true goal? Um, is it not just to interview um, two black candidates or X number of candidates, but the goal is to diversify 
the you know 33 32 33 positions as head coach so that it reflects the the players that are there and a Rooney rule of just two is not really going to get you that goal and so I think you have to start with the the bigger goal and then determine is this really the way to go about that and then um, look at where your pool is and what's the criteria um, that you're um, that you're setting to to identify folks Um, but but there's not the um, it's not enough or there are not enough people to choose from I mean you have to reevaluate what you're using as your metric. Yeah, I think this is, you referenced culture earlier, Regina. I think this is one of those truisms of culture eats strategy for breakfast. And um, if your culture is not oriented toward building a diverse talent pool, then all the rules in the world, all of the strategic plans in the world aren't really going to get at that. Culture is going to find a way, regardless of what some of those policies may be. And so then it becomes a question of what's driving the culture and um, what's driving the kinds of decisions that are creating this environment of really not just only sort of that checkbox diversity, but also um, looking at like where people aren't even bothering to truly adhere to the spirit of the rule. And so you ask yourself, why is that? Right. Well, and I think, you know, the rule, again, good intentions. Um, however, you really do have to address the culture before the rule. Right. Because otherwise you are going to wind up in the oh well, we did it. We checked that box. And so I was thinking about some of the articles I read, particularly with the NFL. There's so much in the relationship. Right. And it's because I know so and so. I know he's a great person. I know he's got this skill. I know he would be great in the role. And, you know, a Bill Belichick recommending somebody for a head coaching position. That's going to get some notice. But I also think it's a question of what kinds of things are you doing to have interactions with other coaches and coaches of color? So, you know, do you know the uh, assistant coach uh, in Arizona or Seattle if you're not the Seattle head coach? Right. And what kinds of opportunities do you give head coaches to really get to know some of these other players? Because in a culture that is as highly relational as I think the NFL is, I think if you start talking about culture busting, you're going to have to do some of those things to really improve relationships as well. Um, but you said culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So maybe one of the things we really need to talk about is culture because the other situation that got so much attention was Wells Fargo, right? And again, this issue of we've already hired somebody for the position, but we have to interview this many candidates of color. So let me bring you on in here, even though it's an open thing. And that, you know, was the whistleblower was here and they were talking about that happening here in Jacksonville. But I think that really does point to an issue of culture. So how do you address the culture in these organizations so that the rule is more of a guideline and helps you to achieve the goal that you were after? Yeah, I I go back to the goal. Like, what is the goal of the environment you want to set? Um, is this the is this the culture where, you know, the most popular person gets, you know, recognized, gets promoted? Or is this one where, you know, folks who are really working hard in their, you know, um, their output, their production is the metric and you sort of base it on that. And so I think it really is about what um, what are we saying is important here? Um, is it the people? Is it the work? Is it a combination? Is it the relationships? And where relationships are, if relationships are going to be key in your culture, how do you make sure that um, people have opportunities to create relationships with all types of people? Is it socials that you set up? Is it uh, work shadowing that you set up? How can you then infuse um, relationship building strategies within the organization so that people aren't just fraternizing with the same sorts of people or the people who are easy to talk to, but really um, creating opportunities for genuine relationships with, with folks across an organization. 
And you really have to ask yourself, you know, what kind of incredible business results would any of these organizations we've talked about be getting if they did have a more inclusive and welcoming culture and diverse leadership, you know, because there's so much incredible research out there pointing to that's really what makes organizations effective. That's what make decision making teams effective. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, how do we kind of help folks understand that not only just culture eats strategy for breakfast, but culture is not one of those like unfixable things, right? Mm-hmm. There's, I think sometimes folks are like, well, it's the culture. And then it's like, well, there's clearly nothing we can do about that. But in fact, there are many, many things that organizations can do. It's not easy. It's not fast. Um, and it's not like just about checking a box, but there are ways to change an organization's culture. So I think that's important to just say is like, if there's a challenge with the culture, that is something that is fixable. So if I'm an organization and I'm struggling with this, right, I don't want to wind up in the diversity checkbox. I do have some culture issues, even though I'm not 100 percent sure what they are. I think one thing that also happens is that people really get concerned about falling into quotas, which should not be the goal, right? It's not that you have to have this many women and you have to have this many uh, uh, black employees and you have to have this many LGBT employees, but really creating an equitable system. So how would you advise corporations, and particularly what you were talking about, Kim, as far as what the goal is, how do you have goals of equity but avoid quotas? Mm, that's a... That's a, a, you you went straight for the gut on that one. Um, Honestly, I think it is, I think part of it is a little bit of a checkbox. I think you look around the rooms where decisions are being made and some things are glaringly obvious, right? Oh, this is a room of all men. Um, I don't have any women in this space, right? Um, And so... When there's another opening, it doesn't mean you have to create a position for the woman, right? But if you have, you know, some folks retiring, some folks shifting around, um, how can I be really intentional about making sure I have a a highly qualified candidate pool of women? Um, Because I want to start this trend of making uh, this reflect my workforce, because I'm pretty sure your workforce isn't mostly men either, um, unless you're in the NFL, (laughs) right? Um, But, uh, and so you would, um, you know, maybe you post with different women career groups or work with your chamber to identify, you know, places to post the the position. And so, um, so you just have that pool. In the end, you still may not, end up picking a woman but the fact that they now your pool is now you know 50 50 where it might have been 90 10 before um at least you have um, an opportunity to hire someone and then um sometimes in the case i think when you get to um like everybody's really qualified everybody these are the same um like i can't go wrong either way then i think you make a choice on you know is it you know am i trying to really as a culture push us forward with some different thinking and this person, whatever it is, I, I'm using women as an example, but fill in the blank with diversity and say, is this person, this person really has an opportunity to help us um, rethink and reimagine. And so that's where we go. Yeah. <clears throat> I think a lot of people might listen to what you're saying, Kim, and be like, oh, I mean, that sounds really hard. You know what I mean? And, and so, and I, I want to like say, yes, it is hard, but so is any other challenge that might be facing a business, whether it's, hey, we need to figure out this type of marketing or we need to keep our costs down in this area or just anything that your business might be facing that's like a hard challenge. Like if this is a challenge that your business is facing and it feels hard, like good because that means you're doing it right (laughs) you know um and so I just want to say like for people who are like wow this sounds really hard like there is it may very well be but it's definitely worth doing and I want to delve a little bit more deeply into Wells Fargo because I think that is a really good case study um and I want to talk about what initially happened and then what their fix has been. Um, but I I really want to follow up with your, this is hard. And I think here's my question. Is it really that hard or is it really different? And so, you know, all these organizations have systems and processes in place to try to minimize the amount of work that's done. But 
is it really just let's look at what the systems are, what the processes are, um, you know, if we're not getting enough female candidates, where are we recruiting from? You're still recruiting, but maybe the location or how you're recruiting, where you're posting um, your position openings changes, right? Um, if you are not moving people through the organization, you're not moving people of color through the organization in management positions, executive coaching and mentorship, sponsorships, those programs still exist, but maybe they're restructured. So it may be a lot of the things that are happening already. And because I feel like sometimes we get caught up in this with this really big task. <laughs> it's the stuff you're doing already, but maybe just doing it a little differently. And I think that corporations really have to look at that. Um, you know, maybe it is a lot of work for HR, but uh, <laughs> they're going to have to do it anyway. And there are a lot of really great models. I mean, that's the thing is nobody has to go out there and reinvent the wheel. There are so many places that are doing a great job with this. And so for anybody who's like, where do I start? I mean, certainly 904 has a lot of opportunities, but there is not, um, you know, there's not a shortage of opportunities, like you said, to pursue. And, And two, I think it goes to leadership. And what is leadership embracing both like publicly and and privately when you talk about the Wells Fargo or any of these situations, actually, you know, um, if there was a rule, but then there was also an unspoken understanding that it was just a checkbox, then that speaks to where do people get that impression? Right. And there's not a there's not a shortage of talent, talent either. Right. Yeah. Um, There you have to just be intentional. I, I can't get away from that word. And I think. Before we've just sort of been doing, not even just checking the box in terms of diversity, but checking the box to have we posted this in the usual places? Have we reached out to our normal recruiters? Um, And we've sort of checked box even those things. And so to your point, Regina, having to go back and revisit even the processes that have become so um, mundane and just uh, a, a ritual uh, and habit more than anything and just say, how can we infuse some intention in here and really be strategic about where we uh, place things? Because that that is also a cultural piece, right? Mm-hmm. To your point, you just said um, somebody got the impression somewhere that this was OK. Um, and so it's, it could just be because uh, processes and things have become stale. There's actually a lot of research around this checklist idea in the medical community um, that there are certain checklists that can prevent infections in the hospital and so on and so forth. And so there's actually been a lot of social science research on it because it's a cost and it's a, you know, very measurable thing. And um, looking at how to, when there are, you know, important checklists like that, how to create a culture where those are not just like posted on the wall, but that are actually used and create a culture within a hospital that people are using the checklist and therefore driving down infections. And they say that a lot of it is really demonstrating the results of something like that. So I wonder if that's a place that could be looked to, you know, to build a culture around this. Yeah, people want to understand why, right? And so you have to show them the fruits of, of why. Yeah. Well, okay, so that actually is a great segue into the conversation I want to have about Wells Fargo, right? And this is being the initial state when the story was blown. They've been interviewing people of color, candidates of color, just for saying they were able to do this. Obviously, that practice was known by some. I don't know if it was known at the higher levels, but I think it's also indicative of some issues, right? Um... Because, again, going to culture and what the goal is. So if the goal is to make sure that you're interviewing candidates of color, what kinds of things should they be seeing if that's actually being done in the proper fashion as opposed to just, oh, yeah, we did it? Because I think for me, that was one of the things I was like, well, where's the checks and balances? Is it just to be able to say that you did this? Um, And so if you want to avoid that diversity checkbox, what are some things that if, okay, we have this guideline because we really want to make sure we have a diverse candidate pool, what kinds of things should we be seeing on the other side to have those things that you can demonstrate this is effective and really benefiting the organization? I think what gets um, 
gets measured or what's get, what gets report what gets measured is what gets reported. And so I think in this case there probably was some metric that somebody was watching mm-hmm. to say how many like did we hide, made this higher did we screen enough candidates of color for this role um and that is probably following the letter of the policy and not the spirit right the spirit is the, what we should see on the other side of interviewing all of these candidates of color we should start to see an uptick in the number of candidates of, uh, of people of color who are filling these roles but if that wasn't the the spirit that people were embodying if they were just following the letter of the law then or the letter of the pro, uh, uh, of the procedure then what you get is we interviewed them and everybody's satisfied with that. Um, And this is where, you know, I think about, I can't help but think about program evaluations where we talk about outputs versus outcomes, right? We want a hundred people in the room, but what do we want those hundred people to have gained as a result of being in that room? And we have to go that extra step and ask that question about what the people get. And it's the same thing here. Um, We interviewed, you know, five candidates of color um, out of out of seven. Um, but what happened as a result of that? And if nobody's checking that, if nobody's coming back to ask that follow-up question, folks aren't really paying attention to it. Right. Like what was the dashboard that they were looking at? Because if you're seeing, wow, we're interviewing a lot more candidates of color, but we're not seeing any change whatsoever in the actual hiring, that tells you a lot right there. Um, and uh, and I'm curious what, whether that was something that was being looked at. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, that why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. Because if it's just to say that you had the pool, then I think that is you, you have a checkbox mentality. Whereas if you're really trying to diversify your organization, then you are looking at what's the actual result of that, right? Um, and... And I I also want to emphasize, because I think lots of times in these kinds of discussions, people feel like we're weighting race or gender or any other uh, characteristic over qualifications. And I want to say, so if they're saying, well, hey, uh, you know, we, we interviewed all of these candidates of color, but they just weren't the best candidate for the job. How do you address those kinds of concerns, because I think employers should be hiring the best candidate for the job. If you are repeatedly having diverse interviews, but not getting the best candidate is not um, in those areas that you're trying to address. How do you uh, address that issue with corporations? I mean, it depends on what I think that's the time to ask yourself, what does it mean the best candidate? You know, are you talking about um, uh, at this point, are you talking about qualifications and skills? Are you looking at the sort of much talked about culture fit? You know, are you, what are, what is really constitute the best? And, um, if that happens, if that's happening over and over, it may be that, um, what means the best candidate may not actually be, um, the correct one. Mm-hmm. Or, and you've seen this in, in some of the research um, and some of the, the articles for this podcast is, you know, if you're if you're hiring people and a lot of it is culture fit, you really want to take a look at those culture drivers and find out, are you actually striving for a homogenous um, group of people? And, and if you are, then it's time to stay, take a step back and say, number one, this may be harming our business. And number two, we're looking to you know, redefine what the best candidate looks like and also redefine what our team should look like as a larger group. Um, And that may mean making changes to the way that that things have always been done. Um, But yeah. Yeah. And even that that culture fit one is like a really big one. And really in in changing the sort of shifting the paradigm a little bit to culture add, like who who is going to add to our culture and enrich it in ways that we haven't thought of before. Um, And I also think, you know, this idea of, of 
accepting a lesser candidate um, is, is certainly not one that, that I agree with. But I would say if you are coming across candidates from your typical ways of recruiting mm-hmm. and candidates are not meeting the standard, you should change your recruiting practices. Um, because that isn't to say that all you know, black candidates are not going to be up to par. Um, perhaps the way that you have recruited and where you've recruited from is not the place you should be looking for those candidates. Um, and you should also provide that feedback to wherever you recruit it from so that they understand and they have the opportunity to make adjustments so that they can prepare their candidates better for roles like the ones you're looking for. I think it's a bi-directional um, relationship. And so um, it really is, I, I mean, I, I can't get away from intention. <laughs> I can't get away mm. from it. <laughs> yeah. And that goes to leadership. Is like, what are your intentions? What is your approach to making this happen? And how is that communicated both internally and externally? And I think truthfully, when you look at leadership as well as culture, I think culture gets emphasized in the hiring and recruitment process when I really think it should be a values alignment that gets emphasized, Mm -hmm. right? Because culture, as you said, this person could be a culture ad and the culture of the organization is important. However, if you have the values alignment with that person, more than likely they can bring something and enrich your culture because your culture should be centered around what your values are. Now, We could also talk about the difference between what the stated values are and what the real values are. Mm -hmm. Whatever the real values are is what's going to be the culture driver. But I think that value alignment is really going to bring you those candidates that um, even if they aren't the culture fit, they would be a culture add and still not disrupt the culture of your organization. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Okay, so after this story broke with Wells Fargo, they went back and they reevaluated and they said, well, we really think that it is important that we still have this requirement for diverse candidates. And we really think it's important for certain level positions that a diverse panel is interviewing the candidates. But we will have the exception rule if you've got in mind somebody who's really perfect for the job or you want to promote within it or, you know, some abilities to work around that rule. What do you all think um, as far as organizations putting that kind of exception in place? I mean, I think when it comes to... When it comes to super, super large companies like that, it's really hard because you could go down like endless rabbit holes of uh, this exception and only applies in these specific situations. And like you could endlessly go down that path. But at the end of the day, you know, and it sounds like they are attempting to make some changes. But at the end of the day, if the culture is not driving that and if it's not getting pushed down, it could get overused. You know, and so if they're going to do something like that, how did the measurements, to your point, Kim, actually looking at, hey, how often are we using that exception? Is it in 5% of cases or 50% of cases? So to some extent, that accountability and those measurements, they can drive some inappropriate decisions, but they can also bring accountability for looking for places where the right thing is not happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a fan of if they are exceptional, let them go through the process like everyone else and they'll stand out. Um, Because I think sometimes we are very limited. I mean, and we're human, right? Um, We're very limited in what we know of folks and become very narrowed in on, on a person. And we haven't given folks an opportunity, new folks, an opportunity to really um, shine in a way that we just didn't consider before. So um, I'm all for an exception, but let the exception go through the same process along with other candidates with this with this you know diverse panel of folks and see if they really hold up. Um, because if point. they are as phenomenal as folks are, are wanting to believe, then um, they will stand out to everybody else too. Right. If they're phenomenal enough to qualify for an exception, they're phenomenal enough to go through the process. Right. That's a great point. Right. 
Well, and I think for me, the big concern is when I initially read the article, the reason that people are following the rule as opposed to the spirit is because you have a cultural disconnect. This adjustment didn't address the cultural disconnect. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when I was in banking in the 90s and Wells Fargo was still solely on the West Coast, we would hear stories about some of the diversity challenges that they had. This is a built-in cultural issue. And I think now, going back to your comment, there is some really hard work that has to be done because you're going to have to undo some of the things that you are addressing. And I I feel like your, your spirit is in the right place because you want to have a more diverse workforce. Um, but I think the methodology, as well as your understanding of the totality of work that has to be addressed to do it effectively, might be much, much smaller than it realistically is to have the results that you need. Right. If it's a if it's a major problem with the culture, which this sort of points to or small tweaks to the rule that was related to it, is that really what's called for in right. the situation? Right. Yeah. And is it going to fix the problem? Right. I, I'm in some ways, I wonder if it's going to even make it worse, because then you can say, no. Well, that was the exception. I, I remember we've mm-hmm. got that. This was a special case. Um, and everybody thinks that their case is special. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. That concerns me a little bit as far as how that's going to be implemented if you haven't addressed the drivers and the culture that we're creating in the first place. Well, and if your culture is one of what we were talking about earlier that centers around this relationships piece, if everybody isn't fairly, you know, in relationship with everyone else, then we are still introducing major bias into the process that having a panel is supposed to uh, uh, at least mitigate, right? Not com- if not completely eliminate in some, in some instances. And then if you're going to have exceptions, why have the panel? Um, their role is to help you vet the candidates from their different viewpoints. If we just rely on exception all the time, then we are still bending to the will of whoever is allowed to pull rank. And um, let's not you know, forget that not long before the sort of whistleblower incident, the 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 CEO was caught saying that um, there are not enough, t- you know, there's not enough black talent um, for some of these roles. So we're talking top down um, that there are just some really um, kind of cringeworthy, uh, honestly, um, features that are showing as, as part of their culture that an exception would would only you know keep it going um mm-hmm. and this is this is a classic old habits die hard right we we have to like really put it put it to bed that this is not how we're going to operate anymore um and this panel is really the way to do this and again you can highly recommend someone put five stars next to their name but let them go through the process with everyone else and then you have to look at the business case of it <clears throat> now because of everything that's come to light and probably a lot of because of what was actually happening inside the organization, it will make it harder than ever for them mm-hmm. to recruit black talent, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so for folks who are any size organization or not one of the organizations that we're talking about, there's an opportunity now to like really look at the culture, really think about what are those drivers of culture and how do we change them to Ensure that you are an organization where folks want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, cities are asking themselves these things. Organizations are asking themselves these things. And these are the right questions. How do you not just become an organization, you know, that has diverse leadership, but that is, is a magnet to people of all different types who want to be in a diverse and inclusive environment where business is going really well? Well, and I also think that going going back to your point about leadership, right, it has to start at the top. And employees know when it's just lip service, right? Um, I remember we had, uh, when I was um, working for a bank, we had one person in senior leadership who was of color, and it was the chief diversity officer, Right. It was very clear to us that leadership didn't value 
diversity. And even though there were small things happening in departments, there were individual people who were trying to make some moves. If it's not coming from the top, it doesn't have the weight, nor will it impact the entire organization. And I think as you talk about how you're structuring things and the culture itself, that's really got to be an organizational assessment of who we are, what we believe, what kind of environment we want to provide. And it has to go through everything, you know, Um, because if you've got a panel to hire your vice president of investments, but you don't have a panel for the um, COO, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really mean anything and employees find it hollow. Yeah. So now we're going to wrap up this discussion. Um, And and today for our takeaways, I want to do it a little differently Um, because while we normally say what was the big takeaway from the conversation, it can be from the conversation, but if you were giving advice to a corporation to avoid the diversity checkbox, what would be your number one piece of advice for them in doing that? Deidre, I'm going to throw it to you first. So I would say don't necessarily scrap your checklist or your checkboxes, but maybe examine, you know, what are your drivers of culture and how it is that your checklist, whatever that may be, is actually reflecting your goals um, as opposed to something that you think might look good to someone else? Um, I would say um, examine your values and not just the values that are sort of written at a company level, but really do some digging to find out what those unspoken values are and surface those. And if, if they're ones that you want to continue, like you want to make them, yeah, this is actually really good, Make it a part of your main values and then the ones that are not the most um, are not who you want to be as an organization. Figure out ways to um, eliminate those so that you can truly live your values and that will attract who who you want to have a part of your organization. And I think that it needs to be a regular conversation, particularly at executive level meetings and you need to hear from the people who are already inside your organization so if you're wanting to hire more women or you're wanting to have more women in leadership positions what are the experiences and challenges of the women who currently work for you what do they see what would they like to see there's so many ideas that you already have Really good ideas, too. Already inside of your organization, do you have the avenues for that type of advice to reach the decision makers in that? And you need to make sure you're creating those. Um, And then look at that in terms of what is our recruitment process, what is our hiring process, what is our promotional process, and what is our decision-making process and how you have diverse representation in all of those levels. All right. Well, it is always such a pleasure to have you all in the conference room. This has been a really great discussion. Thank you all so much. I hope that we've been able to shed some light for some people, um, but maybe even just to think about some of these issues in a different way and get some uh, corporate decision makers to uh, take another look at how they're doing some things. Thanks, Regina. All right. So thank you for joining us for this episode of The Business of Race. We look forward to seeing you in the conference room next week.